Good morning, and thank you for joining today's web event. My name is Laurel, and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I want to quickly review how you can participate in today's web event. You should see a panel that looks like this on your screen at any point during the webinar. You can send in your questions through the questions pane, and we will make sure to answer those at the end. I'm very happy to be joined today by Jeff Carr. Jeff is the CEO of Ultra Consultants and will be presenting our first topic in this week's mm -hmm. web series on how to get the maximum ROI from your ERP project. Jeff has over 40 years experience helping more than 1,200 companies select and implement ERP systems and will share his expertise today. For those who aren't familiar with us, I'd like to give a really brief introduction to Terillium. We are an ERP consulting firm specialized in implementing enterprise resource planning projects. Our, we have 170 full-time employees across the United States with an average of 16 plus years experience. And while ERP projects can carry risk if not performed properly, Terillium is really proud to have won many awards for our ERP implementations. Our mantra is that we are only as good as our last reference, and we believe our success stems from our ability to deliver value <clears> to our customers, and we recognize all of our consultants for their ability to deliver award-winning services. We developed the ERP comparison web series to help companies who are considering a new ERP system it can be a daunting journey, and we thought this series would be a great way to make that process more successful. Later today, we'll jump into looking at various ERP systems, including NetSuite at 2 p.m. Eastern this afternoon. Tomorrow, um, please come back and join us for a demo of Oracle's ERP Cloud. On Thursday, we'll continue the demos with Oracle J.D. Edwards at 11 a.m. Eastern, and we'll wrap wrap the series up with Terillium's president, Dave Woodworth, where we'll examine the ERP project's success factors he's experienced through more than 400 ERP implementation projects. To kick the series off today, Jeff Carr will now lead us through how to get the maximum ROI for your ERP project. Jeff is a sought after expert in manufacturing technology with decades of helping more than 1,200 companies select and implement new information systems. Jeff, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Laura. Let me just get my uh, presentation up here and uh, why don't you share my desktop foot with me? Thank you. Okay. Hopefully you can see my screen, screen now. Yeah, it looks great. All right, great, and uh, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Hopefully we've got some exciting information to share with you today to get you excited about ERP systems. <clears throat> uh, our goal today is to provide you with some Ben insights that will help you get the most out of your enterprise technology investments. Um, here's the agenda that I'll cover today, but it's gonna give you a very brief overview of Ultra. We're gonna get into Talking a lot about at the front end here, uh, the business case for change. Um, and we're gonna look at it in action and we're gonna look at the areas for opportunity. So I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time talking to you about business cases for these particular projects. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the investments you need to be making in people and processes and technology. And we'll finish up with talking about the team structures that you should be developing for this kind of a transformation project. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna close off and give you a couple more resources to, to read about. <clears throat> and finally, hey, we'll have probably have about five minutes or so. So I'll try to keep my eye on the clock here. <clears throat> uh, Alter, real quick, um, we're an independent consultancy. Uh, we do not uh, serve any particular vendor. So we don't have any practices and Oracle or SAP or Microsoft, any of the popular ERP systems. Uh, we're an independent company. Uh, we sell our knowledge of the marketplace and best practices. Uh, we're focused exclusively on manufacturing distribution. That's all we do. We're in North America. We work with companies that are headquartered in North America, although 60% of our business has uh, 
operations overseas. Uh, we work uh, exclusively with mid-market companies as small as 25 million up to uh, a couple of billion. We are a virtual organization. We have 60 employees in the field serving 300 clients. Uh, we're all about driving business process transformation with modern technology, information technology that's going to drive improvements in business performance. So let's get into it. Let's talk about business case for change. So this is all about um, ERP for your organization. Um, the case for ERP in your organization may be obvious or it may require that a lot of people need to be convinced of the need or somewhere in the middle. When it comes to manufacturing, there's obvious investments that need to be maintained or replaced or, up, or upgraded so that you can maintain a viable business. Uh, outdated machinery, your legacy technology, those are good examples. Um, there are some investments that are not so obvious, especially those that require long-term transformation for your business by doing things like being becoming more efficient with internal operations, maximizing your revenue streams and profitability. These are more strategic activities that touch your overall operational effectiveness. Of course, there are many manufacturing companies that are trying to lead their industry or remain competitive while also responding to cost pressures by looking internally and making their internal operations more efficient. They're doing this through operational improvements, using technology to streamline workflow, and using sales and operation planning to manage their overall business and drive their, drive their business transformation. Having the right ERP system and vendor in place is a big part of those internal transformations. ERP systems are more than software that is simply installed and maintained. Implementing ERP and redefining the business processes that go along with it is, in effect, transformative for your business. If it's planned and executed properly, an ERP project is one of a kind of business transformation. So I think that's a key point I want to make here is that ERP is all about transform, transforming your business processes and using that transformation as a platform to drive improvements into your business. So since ERP is a business transformation with an eye on making operational or internal improvements, this will require a substantial investment in time personnel hours, money, and equally important planning. Calculating and maximizing your meaningful ROI from the ERP project is a challenge for most small to mid market manufacturing companies. The cost of a new or upgraded system is easy to identify, but what to select and to measure and how to do it is more difficult. With that in mind, we're gonna look at the business case for change, areas for opportunity, investing in people, processes, technology, and successful team structures. Any business transformation will require some form of investment. Of course, this is fundamental to any project that will affect your business, whether it's an investment in new offices, machinery, operational improvements, like a P project. However, however, any Investment must first have its foundation justified as a, in a business case for change. This is just simply good practice. So in the context of an ERP investment, a proper business case will ensure your investment is well-defined in a project scope with measurable objectives and expectations, is appropriately funded, has its expectations aligned to the company's objectives and strategies, and of course, there are the dollars that you will spend on the product, the vendor services, and the implementation partner, and follow-on services such as maintenance or hosting subscription fees. But also a critical element of the overall business case is to understand that there are multiple components of your investment that deal with internal costs and sacrifices that you make to run your project. This is an area that is not easy to quantify 
in hard numbers. Internal costs includes backfilling resources, change management, internal project management, training and practice time to learn new processes, competencies, and the system. Taking people out of their day-to-day -day role of what they normally do and redirecting them into the project and backfilling these resources as needed is large part of those costs as well. Work often shifts when processes are redesigned. This type of change may require new roles. Everyone always thinks about potential headcount reduction. While headcount may go down in some cases, there are just as many cases where new or different roles are created. As an example, consider an organization that deploy, deploys logistics planning as part of a new system. If they didn't have it before, they may be looking at a new role or even a new department to use that tool and realize its benefits for the business. Investing in training and education to bring people up to speed on the new processes and how to use technology within the new processes. While this is usually covered in the course of the implementation project, oftentimes that training is delivered to the project team and then they must take it out to the organization in a trainer trainer model. In these cases, it's important to consider just how much effort and cost is required to properly train the staff. Also, we need to know what is the continuous improvement plan after implementation. Technology is an enabler. Putting in a new ERP system doesn't generally turn value at go live. Rather, it's a journey. The technology allows the business to continue to improve to continue to leverage the capability and become better, faster, and more efficient. It's important to realize that the value is in the journey. All of these have to be considered and promoted within the project in order to maximize ROI. It's key to make sure that – sorry, my screen's not moving here. There we go. So uh, it's important to make sure we select the right solution. So there's several steps that have to be involved in these activities. Developing your requirements, turning that into a future state design of best practices, identifying improvement opportunities, quantifying those opportunities, and composing a transformation plan or future state roadmap. Now, when we look at um, selecting ERP systems, at Ultra, we have uh, what we call our five factors. And these are the five factors that our clients use to basically evaluate different ERP solutions. Uh, we've got software functionality. Of course, that's number one. That's where everybody places their effort. They want to look at the software, demo the software. But that's only the picture. We need to also look at the cost. So you need to get good proposals from the different vendors that you're working with. And then you need to have evaluate the partnership or the implementation uh, people. So what kind of partnership do we really envision all does the implementation service provider or the software vendor mesh with your organization? Do you feel good about the partnership? Is it a partnership or a transactional sale? Is the vendor stable and do we trust that they'll be here in the future? Uh, I have found over the years, um, and I've ran a software company and I've also run my service company for many, many years. Uh, at the end of the day, people buy from the company they have the most confidence in. So that partnership is very important for you to evaluate. And lastly is the implementation capability. What are, is the support capability that the vendor is offering you? Uh, who are the people that are gonna be involved in that? What are the tools that they provide to you? What is their culture and what, is their, what are the challenges that you see working with them? 
Now let's talk about the business case and how to biz, how to build that business case. Here's a number of opportunities that I see time and time and again in different manufacturing and distribution companies. Each one of these has metrics within your company. Uh, how do we improve those metrics with a new ERP system? What's the value of doing this? Uh, let's just walk through these quickly. Inventory management. So this is about getting better visibility demand in the project forecasts. Inventory could be better managed and carrying costs significantly reduced. Visibility to slow moving or dead inventory can be quickly identified and dealt with. Supply chain management. A better understanding of your network from supplier to plant to customer is very important. And what kind of tools do you need to have better visibility but better velocity in your supply chain? Sales management. Uh, what kind of tools can we give to our sales team to, to basically get a better grasp of what's in the pipeline and how to manage that sales opportunity? I've got product development here. I think I just skipped, sorry. But that's all about the ability to have a com comprehensive analysis of your overall portfolio of products and services. Allows you to take advantage of the 80-20 rule, but also improve the productivity of your people in engineering or product development. Robust pricing tools, pricing and margin, uh, add enhanced visibility to margin profit analysis which drives improved competitive positioning in the domain of product life cycle. Uh, forecasting is a, a key part of driving the right inventories and service levels. Production management, the ability to track and complete production orders. Quality management, this is a hidden cost that people often look at. So. How can I get a better grasp of my quality? How can I keep better track of that and understand where, what is the true cost of quality and how do I reduce that? Employee retention, um, you know, we're seeing the, as the, well, you know, the baby boomers get older and they start to retire and we've got the millennials coming up. Uh, everybody uses windows, everybody uses, clicks and look and feel. So you need to have that. If you have an old green screen type system, that's gonna affect your employee retention. Warehouse management, so the ability to promise shipments. Financial management, the ability to see P&Ls at an instant. Um, and then of course e-commerce extensions and looking at uh, how can I drive into the e-commerce world and get my customers to have a better experience with my customer service team. So these are just a number that you could look towards and dive into and look at, see what are the opportunities for improvement in each one of these areas. This is not a full list. There are certainly other areas that you could be looking at, it, but this is a good start, certainly. There are multiple places to look for the justification of an ERP because it touches everywhere. Inventory reduction obviously doesn't happen on day one. Processes and put into motion to burn, burn down inventory without impacting customer satisfaction. Slow moving inventory or dead inventory also needs to be sold or scrapped. This usually takes several months, so business case must accommodate that timeline of transition. By having accurate inventory visibility, supplier scorecarding and accountability metrics and various other tools. 
purchasing can be far better positioned to negotiate with suppliers or drive logistic costs down to more controlled lever levers. For instance, you know, we, we talked about purchase cost. A 1% reduction in purchase cost is a substantial for an annual spend of, let's say, $100 million. This could drive a lot of bottom line benefits. Realistically, revenues are not going to increase because of a new, but providing the sales organization with best practices and tools to better build customer relationships, track activities of all, have faster answers, be more confident securing the deal and delivering to, to promise. One time, every time. Now that drives the competitive advantage and makes your company the preferred choice. This particular screen shows 99 significant opportunities that were identified by this company as they were beginning to look at their requirements and look at opportunities. So it's not so much that you, when you look at ERP vendors, it's not, don't look so much at looking at feature and function. Make sure you understand your current state and what your opportunities are. And then as you list those opportunities and you count them and you start to analyze each one, you can drive into defining what that opportunity for improvement is, as we see on this particular chart. So ROI is very important, uh, but alone, alone, it's rarely the driver for selecting a given system. So we'll look at this particular analysis that we did for a client. We see that the ROI for vendor one is 69%, but for vendor three, it's 102%. Clearly the choice in this case would be vendor three, but the company chose vendor one because there was a different factor. Patient confidence in vendor one was far greater than vendors two or three, so they were you know, ROI was good, but it wasn't the sole deciding factor. So, consider uh, a straightforward one-year implementation product project. The first year is spent implementing, so that's all cost. The software is purchased up front, plus consulting services are paid out in year one. The real benefits are not realized until year two. And these benefits are realized only if you do your homework and define the benefits. They need to be quantified, prioritized, and there should be a clear roadmap of the features and functions as well as the process changes in a roadmap that is easy for everyone to understand. Here's another way of looking at it. In this view, you can see how most of the outline happens in year zero. For a larger projects, where there's a rollout across multiple sites and functions, this outlay of implementation costs might happen over two or three or more years. Typically, in a bid size company, it's, it happens in the first year. However, in all costs cases, we'd expect that payback to begin after the go live. It will take most of the first year of that go live for the benefits to ramp up. In other words, it might take most of the first year to work through excessive obsolete inventory, for example, or to fine tune processes and improve on time delivery. So we can also, we can see all of this in the chart, plus there's some analysis here between uh, the confidence intervals. <clears throat> being a conservative target versus high achievement target. Here we see another way of looking at ROI. Uh, actually looking at ROI and where is that break even point? So we put, uh, you know, we've put all of the opportunities together and we've added them up and we've added the cost up and we've built this graph, this projected cash flow break even point. So we can clearly see where that break even point is, in this case, year three. Again, this is a, a good tool for you to be using. And uh, let me just say this one comment. To me, this is not all about 
justifying the system to the board of directors. To me, this is a, all about setting the goal line for the project. Because when we're done with this exercise, we're gonna have a clear list of improvements to the business that we seek as a result of this project. Those then need to be front and center throughout the project, but especially after you go live. Remember, going live is not going to get the benefit. It's the use of the new system that's gonna drive the benefits and the benefits are gonna be realized over time. I've seen way too many companies go into this particular with all of their focus on just the go live. And when the go live is done, everybody claps and says, okay, let's get back to work. That's not the right decision. The right decision is to keep the team focused on driving business performance improvements with the new system and using these tools that you developed at the beginning of the project that identify the opportunity to drive improvements in the business. So let's look, a few, look at a few experiences and talk about a real case study with ROIs. So here's customer one. This is a toy manufacturer. They've got old technology. Uh, they've got a supply chain that reaches all the way to China. Um, they brought Ultra in to perform a variety of services for them. You know, it started with the current state, future state, all the way through selection and then eventually implementation. Um, this company is interesting. Uh, you could see the ROI in action over here to the right, but the interesting thing I always found about this company was that they were able to, uh, um, because they outsourced everything for the most part, they were primarily a, um, a design company and then a logistics company, supply chain, so in sales and marketing, of course. Uh, so, but you know, they outsource all the manufacturing and outsource all the distribution. Uh, so this particular case, you know, they had uh, very high revenue per employee. But by implementing the new system, every increment of the revenue uh, was not followed by an increment in, in overhead, headcount. So there was a clear improvement in terms of this particular business because they were able to get a lot more revenue going with the same headcount because of the productivity and the efficiency that they got from the new system. Here's another uh, ROI areas for improvement. In this particular case, we're in the automotive industry and it's an automotive parts supplier. Um, basically, this is all about data integrity <clears throat> and getting one truth, a single truth of the business that we could look at, single version of the truth. Uh, again, Ultra provided its services for the current future state definition and implementation management. And you can see to the right, the significant return on investment. So they're looking at $3 million a year for their particular business after the implementation of the new system. Here's a look at, um, all of the factors that went into that particular evaluation, uh, the one-time cash release, 2.8 million, and then the inventory management. So you can see it kind of all bundled together with ongoing benefits of $3 million. So the ROI is really a summation of all of the opportunities within the business. At last, here's a, Company number three, uh, manufacturer of data loggers, a small mid-sized company, um, about $30 million in annual revenues. Uh, again, they managed electronic, they manufactured electronic equipment. Um, this was all, to them, it was all about improving cycle time. Again, Ultra was involved in current state, future state implementation, and then the follow-on to help them drive improvements. So we, we were really involved 
uh, cradle to grave, if you will, you know, from beginning to end. So when I say beginning to end, we basically uh, got them through the selection into the implementation, got them live, and then help them drive improvements into their business. And we're still doing that. Um, interesting thing about this particular situation, this company owner wanted to sell his company. He was getting, you know, long in age and uh, wanted to sell the company. And uh, he felt it was important before he did that to really modernize his information system and drive the benefits from that. You know, think of it as putting on a new paint job on your house, but um, you know, you're it's more than that, of course. But it's it's what do you do in order to clean up your business in order to sell it? By doing this, he was able able to dramatically increase the value of his company at the time of sale. So let's move on to investments in people, process technology. Um, to achieve these rev these ROI, uh, there's, there's multiple investments that need to be made in three areas. So you need to be thinking about people of your organization, the underlying process, order to cash, et cetera, and the technology supporting these processes. The details of how to connect the dots to the ROI and how did we determine inventory was a big factor in the ROI. All of that is important to kind of figure out as you go through this. So here's a chart that kind of talks about the processes. You know, that's, uh, that's where we spend a lot of time with clients up front is really understanding their current state, educating them on best practices, and helping them derive a definition of the future state so that they can really get a, make sure they have a good handle on the project. You got to know your current state. You got to know best practices. You got to know, you know, what your future state is going to be. Then you can start talking to, to the vendors, but not until then. So you really need to make an investment in understanding your business processes up front. People are very important. Um, so as you're putting this project together, you're going to want to look for your best people, but the whole company is going to be affected by this. So functionally, your management team, as they're looking at this and looking at new, better business processes, we need to figure out how to be promoting the competencies and strengths. We need to be identifying individual competency gaps uh, and we need to be enhancing the ability to do things better, and managing a constructive change approach. So people, investing in your people during this particular project is very important. Also the organization, um, as we mentioned earlier, there's gonna be changes. Implementing a new system will involve change. You need to manage change. Change will happen for people, and it will also happen for organization, and it also happens for business processes. So you need to realize that you've got to manage change, and managing change can affect the people, but also the organization. Where do we have gaps in the organization for the new system? Uh, what are our organizational design strategies, and are we aligned our resources to a new organization? Here's an example. Uh, in this particular case, on the left, you see the current state. You know, we had a manufacturing company, had pr production management. They did job scheduling, shop floor management, shipping and logistics. Fairly straightforward. But then they started to wanted to make improvements. And they felt that they needed to drive sales and operation planning into their particular process to get a better grip of their, their demand and uh, their customers. So they implemented the SOP governance, um, but that required some additional changes within the business. Uh, they needed to understand uh, what their forecast should be, because that needed to be input into the SNOP governance. So well, there were some new processes here that they needed to implement, it, and they needed new functionality from their ERP system to drive both not only forecasting, but also governance. There's also investment in technology. 
that you need to be thinking about. In that particular case, the previous one that I mentioned, uh, you know, technology is where we began to see a lot of different benefits. Um, we saw a lot of improvements. Um, they had a lot of issues, as you could see on the left. Um, and then on the right, you could see over here that they made some changes. They started to take some of the in-house staff um, with existing staff and some outsourced and some organizational assessment in order to determine their needs. So they were driving the improvements of technology that came out of the process to look at the entire the entire current state and future state. That led them to these particular conclusions. As they drove into the technology and they got to the plant floor, they started to see a lot of improvements that they could make in that particular area. And you could see these here, you know, the areas where they, they found significant improvement for the business. And you could just kind of read through these in terms of common stuff that you'd normally see on a plant floor. They were starting to get into just typical routings, but also GPS for field service, programmable logic. You know, today we see things like Internet of Things. And um, we see a lot of changes that are going on with the technology on the shop floor. All of that requires the use, gathering, the use of gathering and and providing feedback back to the people that are using it. Significant improvements can be found on the plant floor. There's a lot of things being written today about Industry 4.0 and, and Internet of Things. Uh, I advise my clients to get involved in that to understand where that's going. Uh, I, I visit a lot of manufacturing plants every single month, hundreds of them over the years and years. Uh, thousands over decades, uh, and I've seen a lot of changes. And the biggest impact we're having, we've seen in the last couple of decades, of course, has been robotics. And the plants that maybe you saw 10, 20 years ago and go to them today, they're entirely different. So there's significant improvements that can be found in the, in the manufacturing shop floor. All right, let's look at team structures for the transformation. Just give a quick check here of time. All right, we've got about 20 minutes left. So um, ultimately, it's, uh, you know, you need to have the right team in, in place to establish a framework for improvements. Focus on and drive improvements during the fruition of the implementation. First of all, we need a steering committee. It's critical to have the right executives at the top. Their role is to remove roadblocks, decision approval, and promote change, promote the need for this particular project. A key member of the steering committee is going to be the executive sponsor. This individual will sit on the weekly status meetings with the project manager. He or she will be intimate with all the details of the project, the goals and the roadblocks. Their job, in addition to the ro role of the steering committee, is to be that communicator with the rest of the steering team. The conduit between the steering team and the project team. Therefore, choosing the right sponsor is critical to the success of the project. They need to be respected by the organization and able to filter real issues from bumps in the road. So that's number one. We need to have a steering committee. We need to have an executive sponsor. Number two, we need to have project management. So the project manager is the leader of the project. He or she owns the project plan and all the deliverables, as well as communicating with the executive sponsor on all open issues. The project manager is also in charge of risk management and communication. The project manager drives the activity in the project and drives the completion of the activities. Uh, gets involved, of course, risk management, mitigation, issue resolution, and leads to schedule deliverables, milestones, et cetera. Project management experience is critical for any for this type of a project.
The team of the project needs to have each function of the organization representative. These individuals are not only responsible for the overall success of the implementation, but they're also responsible for achieving the improvements and best practices within their functional silos. Each improvement in the ROI should be assigned to one person on the team, even if it crosses silos. These individuals in some ways are all managing individual mini projects. As part of the team, there would be someone from an external consultant company like Ultra who is driving best practice and a software vendor consultant that drives the configuration of the software to meet these needs. So it's important to have this cross-functional team. You need to represent all of your businesses. Um, you need to have best practice consulting assistance and also configuration assistance. But that group works together to drive the project. Also, we need a technology team uh, that's responsible for all the tech. And you can see all the different pieces over here on the right. Sometimes part of this is outsourced. When we look at cloud solutions, uh, the project team from the previous art will add technology team and configuration data testing uh, the production environment and security. Scaling, database management, patch, upgrades, disaster recovery all need to be handled by these teams as well. Unless the software is a true cloud implementation where some of these could be handled by the cloud vendor. In this view, we can see how the team is pulled together. The size of the team will be directly proportioned to the size and scope of the project, which typically is driving by size and complexity of the business. We've got projects that have as few as five people on the team, not including the vendor, just within the company, and then others that are as large as 50 people that would be on the team. Um, again, it's it, each company is different, and each company has a different group of people, so it's important that you spend a lot of time thinking about who are the right people for the right seats in this particular project. Um, we talked about the executive sponsor, talked about the project manager. Next most important person is what I call the business process owner. So that business process owner owns that subset of the project, and he has a set of years that he serves, and he is, is to make sure he's providing to them op business processes to drive efficiency and improvements into the business. So let me just recap here, and then we Q and A. I got a couple of things here I want to provide you. Um, first of all, let's summarize. The project or the uh, report today. You know, we talked about the business cases. We talked about the business case for change in action. Uh, we talked about opportunities for ROI. We talked about investments in people, process, and technology. And lastly, we talked about team structures for ten. Now, I'd just like to point out a couple of. Uh, things for you. Um, we have published something we call an ERP toolkit. <clears throat> um, we believe that modern technology you know, does drive business per performance improvement, uh, but the decision for you to upgrade or implement new technology is likely one of the most complex and resource intensive initiatives of a company will face. Manufacturers and, and distributors have told us that it's difficult to understand how to begin these projects. The complexity and scope are pretty overwhelming. To simplify our customers' experience, we've created this toolkit that leverages Ultra's unique perspectives as trusted independent advisors while serving manufacturing and distribution teams. Uh, this is available on our website. We can make sure that it gets to you through uh, Terillium. Um, Inside, you'll find educational assets, including videos, podcasts, white papers, best practice expertise for an effective technology project. Within these assets, you'll find tips to organize the project, like we talked about today, resource, and reduce, reduce the risk of failure and drive change management, and curated resources 
illustrating what it takes to evaluate and select and implement enterprise technology. One last tool that I'd like you to be aware of. Um, as an independent consulting firm, we continually strive to bring up-to-date information and best practice education to the manufacturing and distribution industries. In the old days of ERP implementations, we heard a lot of outdated research related to ERP implementation success rates. They told a pretty dismal story. If you remember 10 years ago, it was, you know, boy, I don't want to do one of those ERP projects. Is this still the case? Well, last year, we went into a partnership with mid uh, the company that was formed out of Aberdeen. Uh, they conducted a survey for us to answer this and other questions to understand to the current state of the industry. And the report provides an eye-opening data that flips the script on previous surveys that in the past focus on outdated industry data. This report titled The Real Facts About ERP Implementation is a definite report for anyone who needs to understand the rates of implementation success and failure experienced by today's manufacturing distribution industry. And this is a, can be accessed through our website and we can make sure you get a copy of it through the folks at Trillium. Uh, this is a very interesting report. I'm continuing to follow up on this report with the ERP vendors and, and verify some of the results. But this report finds for two thirds of the people that, that uh, um, have started and initiated these projects have had success. Um, also, but it also shows some things that people have to be aware of. It points out that uh, only 40% of the people uh, are uh, reach the end of the, the implementation project on budget. So 60% of people go over budget. Keep that in mind as you're thinking about a new system. Uh, but read the report. It's a great report to get a lot of data, a lot of statistics in there So for you to uh, be able to work with, especially at the sea level, them to get an understanding, hey, these projects are not killers anymore. They're not that hard. They are hard, but they're not as bad as they used to be. And there's a far greater rate of success going on today in industry, which is truly driving improvements in businesses and into the economy. All right, that's my, uh, that's the conclusion today of the presentation. So I'm now gonna, uh, Look for questions uh, that I can great, try to answer. Great. So we've. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, this is Laurel. I, um, I've i also, thanks for mentioning that report. I've read a little bit of it and it is very interesting. So that's definitely a good resource um, to check out. And thank you again for all the content you've presented today. Very helpful. Um, we do have a few questions, so I'll go ahead and um, give those to you. But in the meantime, if anybody else has any other questions, please go ahead and send those in through the questions chat and we'll we'll get those answered. But a few that have come in. Um, the first one, we have buy-in and are ready to move ready to evaluate software. Is a business case necessary? Um, you know, uh, the choice is yours, of course. Um, I, again, I'm going to just restate what I said earlier, that the business case is not the tool for buy-in. It is a tool to improve the business because it helps you identify what the opportunities are in the business for improvement. And so it gives you that list that you can use to make sure you're buying the software that's going to give you those tools. But also, it gives you a list that you use while you're going through implementation and at the end of implementation to have to give you activities that you should be doing to drive improvements into your business. So the business case, simply put, is the goal line for the project. The goal live date is not the goal live. That's just the first half. That's just part of the, the game. The goal line, the completion, the score a touchdown is the improvement of your business. And the business case helps set you up for that success. 
Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I agree. Yeah, we've seen the same thing at Trillium. So thank you for that. Um, okay. Next question. What do you see as the typical ROI on these projects? Uh, I always look to a three to five times ROI. Typically, I see that as being drives and uh, usually attainable over the first three years of the project, uh, five at most. But uh, we usually, after go live, usually see, start to see some improvement, but the real true improvement usually happens in year two and year three. And again, I typically see about three to five times cost. So if I'm going to spend a million dollars, I'd like to see a $3 million return on my list of opportunities. Great. Thank you. All right. Last question. Uh, we have a strong IT group driving this project. How much should the business group be involved? Um, the business group should lead the project. Um, they should be supported by the IT group. The business people have to use the system that you're going to acquire. They need to own that decision. Now, having said that, the IT folks have a voice in that. So if they see things, if they disagree, or if they see tech, especially technology issues, they need to voice those. But the people that should own the project in your company should be the business people. And those are the people that should be driving it. But they have to be supported by a strong IT group. Back to you, perfect. Laura. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that, Jeff. And thank you again for your time today. I want to thank everybody again for joining us this morning and um, remind you and invite you to join us again this afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern for a NetSuite demo. Um, I do, if any other questions come up, please feel free to reach out to Ultra or Trillium um, and we'll make, we'll make sure to follow up with you. But thank you again for joining us and thank you again to you, Jeff. All right, thank you and good luck to everybody. Uh, hope to hear from you someday, but uh, good luck with ERP. Thank you. Yes. Definitely. Thank you. Bye.